Well, we're here this morning, like I said, on the 22nd, and we're going to do a little food plot management, reed, weed eradication. Now in the background are several different items people can use today in their fight against weed uh, eradications out of their food plots and their, you know, attempts to uh, grow forage for the wildlife. And just a vast variety, and it comes from the most primitive tools, which would be your hands. Uh, hands would be uh, technical helped along with gloves upon them, because you never know when you reach into something that's got thorns on it. <laughs> uh, it'll get your undivided attention in a hurry. So leather gloves upon your hands, and basically your hands on a strong back and a strong will to succeed are your best two primitive tools that mankind's used since they decided to grow uh, a forage crop to consume. Now, as I step out of the way here, <clears throat> you'll notice there's several different herbicides. And we have a tank sprayer that can be electric or PTO driven. That's on the tractor. And we have a small backpack sprayer, which is approximately four gallons, that you would mix and spot spray with that. Now these other two items are an advancement over hands. They are garden hose. And my grandmother ran one every day of the summer, and she kept a well-groomed organic food source for human consumption without any herbicides whatsoever back in the days. Now, over here are two products from Whitetail Institute, and it, both of them do separate deals, uh, jobs. The, the rest or rest max will kill the grasses or suppress them. Sometimes if they get too tall, they may not kill them, and that's really important. The time frame is really important to get that on. Uh, um, no matter the height of the crop, um, if the grass is growing, it's time to get that on. The other one is slay, and that's for the broadleaf weeds. And there again, they work so much better when the weed is in its infancy. And this little jug right here is the backbone of both of those. That's crop oil. And what that does, it adheres the herbicide a lot better to the undesirable weeds that you're trying to get rid of. You know, some of them are slick coated. Um, they they basically shed any herbicide off and you get, you do get some results, but that little crop oil is a must. You should use it. It doesn't have any overbearing effect. It just helps to adhere your herbicide to your foliage. Now, on the left here, you have several different ag herbicides, and they work excellent. I don't know how many are on the market. Uh, but you better follow and read the label instructions. Some of these you can put on uh, pre-emergent, and then you can go ahead and prime post-emergent. A lot of farmers today go with pre-emergent, and the only thing that comes up is their um, agriculture crop. The weeds have been suppressed. Some of them take at least an inch of rain to get activated, so you have to hold off for a certain time after spring. But there again, um, you want to, this jar bottle back here is um, crop oil, and what that does, it enhances all those herbicides, whether it be pre-emergent or post-emergent. And um, then down here on the front, you have, this is a real critical thing, well, that, that's not the critical thing. Uh, that's just the sinister, which is a real good post-emergent. But when you apply something like that, 
you've got to understand it stays in the ground and you will have to wait X amount of months before you can plant certain crops to rotate them. So you got to read those labels and you got to be up to speed on what you're spraying. The, this back one is a real important, it's not a herbicide, it's a tank cleaner. And what it does, it cleans out your tanks so that if you use the same tank and you want to uh, put a different herbicide in, that you've eradicated the residue of the previous herbicide completely from your tank. Now, <clears throat> once we've done that, you can go in with a liquid fertilizer. They have several of them, and they have powder, ammonia sulfate type surface, uh, but they're a powder, and you have to mix them, and you have to watch uh, that they don't have a bad reaction once you put the herbicide and the powder together. I don't run with the powder because uh, I just elect not to. Not that it doesn't work, it's just I'd rather go with uh, like the fertilizer, a liquid fertilizer, and you can tank mix these. But follow the label instructions and you can be de-weeding and fertilizing at the same time. Now, like I said, these two items here, this hoe and the, a, a different form of hoe, uh, uh, are, they don't discriminate. You can use them year-round without any harm to your crop or your future crop. Now this bushel basket, it comes in real handy when you're hand weeding and you get out in the middle of the field and you can't throw the weeds to the, to the timber. You can throw them in, in there and you get a lot of weeds in and take them over and dump them out. And there's one more item and we'll go up on top and we'll discuss another item that helps you fight the battle with weeds in your fields. So let's wander up there and uh, get a video of that. Now what we have here, ladies and gentlemen, is a one row cultivator. It's a shank type cultivator. You notice the shanks on it. And this spacing in between is where you would drive your small tractor down one row at a time. And the row would go in between here, and you have six shanks on it, and that would scaffire fire a 38-inch row, or you can move it, if you have a 30-inch row, you can move it in and out, it's adjustable. Uh, very reasonably priced, doesn't cost an arm and a leg, but if you were reluctant to spray herbicide, and you had a small tillage tractor, like a lot of you have, um, this would work excellent. And just take it slow. The only drawback to it is the smaller the tractor, the slope, the lower it is. And so eventually if the crop gets too tall, then you would be knocking it over with the bottom of the tractor. That's the only drawback with that. But by that time you'd hope that the, possibly the corn or the beans would be uh, high enough to shade out the majority of the weeds. Now we're going to venture over here to this quite old cultivator. Now what you're looking at is a two-row Massey Ferguson, Massey Harris cultivator. And in my youth I ran such cultivators when we cultivated sweet corn. Uh, at that era of time a four-row was modern. But what this does, and I'll show you, this has what you call fenders on it. This is set out right now for a 38 inch row. You could set it in for 30 inch if you wanted to. As you can see, the shovels are adjustable, or the sweeps as they call them. It, the thing I have to do on this particular tractor is reverse the wheels, because right now if I tried to run it down a 38 inch row, the tires and the wheel, well the tires basically, would be running over your crop. 
on my older Fords, which I call older, they were from the 1960s up to the late 70s, the wheel on those tractors, you could spin out, and that was a beautiful asset. And the front wheels you have to set out too. Now to do that, you have to take this wheel off, put it on the other side, and put the other side on this side, it's called the reverse, and that sets the wheels out. And the same thing has to be done with this rear, the rear wheels. You just take and put them on the other side of the tractor, and that is reversing them. And like I said, in some of my finer ag tractors, it was really nice because you just loosened up some nuts, held the brake, and it would spin those wheels right out uh, without taking the wheel off. But these cultivators, like I say, they work pretty nice. They work up until your corn's laid by, and they got the sweeps, and they go down. And you can follow up with herbicide if you had a, uh, still had a weed problem. And I picked this antique of a cultivator up for around $300. I think it was $320. Bucks. And it's in perfect working condition. It, uh, so, I mean, it's not a rich man's situation. I mean, I was in the store the other day, and a guy bought a $60 carton of cigarettes. And it's like, gee, you know, if you did that five times, there's your $300. That, uh, and all that is blowing smoke. And another item in, or piece of equipment, is your rotary cutters, whether they be small or bigger, that will help set back the fast growing broadleafs and the grasses. And then after, say, a week, once the grasses and her, they decide to re rejuvenate, then you can come in and spray your herbicide. But don't spray your herbicide right after you mow because the weeds aren't going to mow. They're in shock. And it takes them about a week to start the regrow process. And that's when they will absorb your herbicide. And like I say, any kind of mower is a plus in the battle of weeds. Because if you mow them down, chances are your perennial crop will give them a chance to get ahead of the weeds and shade the weeds out. So let's go up here and do some... Uh, weed management. Oh, and by the way, you ain't going to do no weed management with spray today because it's raining, the, the foliage is all wet, and don't spray on a rainy day or a windy day because you're going to have negative results. Well, there we got a visitor out there. It's about 7.30 in the morning and it looks to me like a doe out there in the bean field. So, that's pretty cool. And I can tell they've been in the cornfield because I got some corn damage. But let's get back to business. The last time you seen this cedar tree was a matching set of an eight point buck was underneath of that. And what we got now, we got some water hemp and some velvet leaf that we didn't spray that close to the tree because you know, and I could I could spray that with 2,4-D and it would take those weeds right out. But I got an alternative way that won't harm the tree. This doesn't take long. And like I said, once the weeds get too tall, you know. So what we'll do is we'll go in here and you'll notice it doesn't take long to chop those weeds right out of there. You can really go to town on them in very little time. Taking the root, the whole nine yards, right out of there. And you want to get these islands of these weeds that your herbicide didn't get, you want to get them out because what they will do, they will foster the new seed bed because they will germinate and eventually after they germinate, they'll spread their seed, and if the wind blows them, you just got an overseeding of undesirable weeds. So it's important to get as many of them out of there as you can. Now, like I said, it's 
several ways of going about getting weeds out of your field. A hoe is a good tool. There again, wives ask husbands, what can I get you for a birthday present? What can I get you for a Christmas present? On and on and on. Simple tools become great allies and assets to a food plotter in fighting uh, annual and perennial weed growth. So just a little something to share with you. Like I said, the ground's really soft and it takes very little effort to take those weeds out of there. Also, they have also they have different styles of hose today. This is more like a push shovel and you just slide it along the ground and point it downward and it takes that weed out really fast. I'll show you. I'll get the camera there. It's really hard to do this stuff live by yourself and it takes a special effort to try to show but this is all this one does. It just shoves it into the ground and easy operating, user friendly, you know, and you're using the weight of your body and those little pockets of weeds no longer are there. And uh, like I said, it's relevantly fast. It's a push type hose instead of a pull hose. So it just so it just does it in reverse. So let's go over here. We got quite an infestation around this cedar tree and we want to get them out. And there again, I said, if I wanted to put 2,4-D on there, it would wither these valve leaf up. But I got a cedar tree there and I really don't want to put 2,4-D that close to that tree. Uh, I know a lot of people disrespect cedar trees, but to me, I find them valuable for winter habitat for birds and like I said buck laid under there and shed a heck of a set of uh, antlers under that cedar tree to get in out of the elements so let's wander over here to this one here is an excellent spot to hand weed now watch how easy these come out you got the whole rup with you and like I said I'm working with nature, not against her. She gave me an inch and three quarters of rain, and it makes pulling these weeds just that much easier. I mean, in today's generation, we've been eradicated from physical labor so bad that I'm afraid for this country's physical endurance. Uh, going to a fitness club and putting weight on a bar and bench pressing it or doing something. Now granted that does have some merit but that's not how our country grew its strength. It grew it through manual labor and through manual labor you gain mental toughness. Going to a health spa and paying somebody to prance around and sweat <laughs> Find something else to do that your body will do naturally and push yourself. A lot of people ha seek they have to have a crowd. So they have to go gravitate to a physical fitness center so they can wear the latest, the greatest little workout. This ain't no workout clothes. This is get down on your knees, get muddy and kick ass and pull the weeds. I had a football coach, Frank Gilson. And he recommended every one of his football players that he coached, which he was one hell of a coach. One of the most winning coaches at Southeast Polk. He basically mandated that you bailed hay or walk beans back then to get your physical toughness and your body in shape. So when you suited up in late August to come out to his football practices, that you didn't just keel over from sitting on the couch playing video games as they do today. So doing this little bit of work, I don't want to, well, I don't care if I piss people off or not. I'm telling you the truth, Jack. The hard work don't ever hurt anybody. Matter of fact, it's a free way of working out. So let's get these weeds pulled. 
I'm not bragging. I'm not trying to show off. I'm just showing you what I do. And I, to help the guy that may only have the hoe, may only have the small tillage equipment. But if you got the willpower, we are the people that walked from Plymouth Rock to San Francisco Bay in 240 some years of history. And we endured all kinds of setbacks. Lewis and Clark pulled canoes upstream, up the Missouri uh, River, and floated them back down. Those were the kind of men that made this country. And they used what they had, their backs, their strength, and their mental toughness. If you use those, you can kick ass in any situation that you will come upon in your journey here on this planet. Here it is, the 22nd day of June. We've had over six inches of rain now here on these fields. Last year we only had an inch and a half in the entire month of June. The crops were under severe stress. And I had a subscriber ask me if I planted cover crops in my corn. And my answer was no. Now the reason I don't plant cover crops is two reasons. I'm going to show you one reason right here. Down here on the row of corn and it has a little germination of weeds, very little. They're maybe two inches tall, but they're shaded out of the sun now. And that's what a lot of people strive to get the corn laid by. Once the corn's laid by, the sun don't get to the ground. And so the weeds are shaded out. And that's one reason. And the other reason is that this corn is almost head high. And it really grew rapidly. But the other reason I don't plant cover crops is because I leave the crop standing and I don't, till, I don't harvest it. And so, therefore, I would be knock, have to knock the corn down or pick the corn, which would defeat my purpose for a winter food source, just to plant a cover crop. If you oh, manage your land and your nitrogen uses and your phosphorus and potassium right, you won't have to have those cover crops to hold the soil in place and you won't have to have them to burn up the excess nitrogen because it's being consumed in this corn crop. The other thing is I plant 38 inch rows because I do not use anhydrous ammonia. That saves me money. I, I side dress with urea and it gets the job done. Now, if I was to come in with anhydrous ammonia, it would cost me more money just to grow deer food. But it looks like it's coming along pretty good without that extra expense. So those are some of the reasons. Like I said, I'd have to harvest the corn, defeat my purpose of growing it, just to plant a cover crop to recapture that little nitrogen that I put back in the ground and on a year like this it looks like it's being used up pretty good. And right now the corn is using maximum amount of nitrogen at this stage. This is when the nitrogen really comes into play. So that's just a little bit on why I don't plant cover crops in my rows. There's another example why I plant food plots. I always told you it's not just for white-tailed deer, cotton-tailed rabbit. Uh, I plant it for the overall habitat and the welfare of all wildlife, not just one targeted animal. Here is a situation that I did purposely. You notice the weed growth in this beans. I elected not to use a herbicide on this area because I'm going to replant this in two months in August with a fall annual a barasca type possibly pure attraction. Now as you wander over here you can see the results of my spraying on my herbicide. It eradicated, what you see in the middle of these rows are some of the beans. These aren't weeds that you're seeing here, these are actual soybeans. 
and I had a few beans left over so I just sort of broadcasted them on and you know so they look like weeds in a row but basically the the, the beans are are uh, they're 22 days old now or 21 I planted them on the first so if you went that way they'd be and I th they're 38 inches apart and I walked thousands of acres of 38 inch rows of beans a kid chopping out volunteer corn before uh, herbicides were invented and they will bush out and shade over and you can see they had a little bit of stress on them this little bit of yellowing from the herbicide and that's normal but with these rains that will resurge and like I say when you look down here and you see this green in the middle of the rows that's not weeds that is Oh, there might be a few weeds in there. I ain't going to say it's 100%. But most of it, for the most part, it's the beans that I broadcasted on just to get rid of them. And some of them germinated. Now, if I wanted to, and I was having a, a weed problem, but you can see all these little, all this brown. This was what the herbicide did. This was all broadleaf weeds. That'll give you an idea of how powerful that herbicide was at that stage it really knocked them out uh, it's always a toss-up you know th 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 those beans are six inches tall and I decided to spray them we had exceptionally hot weather and those weeds were on the march and now with this moisture the beans will get resurged and they should start really getting some height to them. With, uh, we're coming into July, we'll be in July within basically what, eight days, and uh, that'll be coming on. And this stress will be off of them, because that's normal when you spray your herbicide, that that would be some curling or some uh, turning a bronze color, but, uh, you have to go that to get rid of the weeds and it really got rid of the weeds now you can see there is a row of beans in there and I'm going to take the push type sweep hoe and I'm going to go down through there and I'm going to show you the row of beans in there and how fast you can get them out manually oh here we go get right by the bean row this is in the center. There's the bean. You can go right up alongside of it. If you want to, you can do both sides as you're going down. Get them out. You might as well get that out. See how fast this simple tool worked. There's your row of beans. The weeds are gone. We'll go on down the rest of that row. We'll take our pool type hoe and we will finish weeding that off pretty fast. Now, if you got big fields, you're not going to be able to do that. But for you guys that got small, uh, small acres, it's not acres, but eighth of an acre or something like that. These little tools will do the job. Like I said, this is the pull hole where you're pulling the hole. And like I said, I found out this little push type hoe actually was superior to this pool type traditional garden hoe for the simple fact you were using physics with this hoe you had to exert more energy pulling the hoe towards you with this one type sweep little hoe you use kinetic energy of your body 
as you as you wait, push it forward. And it was a whole lot easier. It went in the ground a lot easier, and it actually cultivated more thorough. But so it actually, this type of hoe, if you were going to go to the garden in the right conditions, would be superior to your t traditional type garden hoe. So I'll finish this on out. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. You can see the bean row. Uh, the weeds have been eradicated. And, you, you know, in a small situation, very handy. One other thing to keep in mind that will make it easier for you is when you're using these tillage tools, hand ones, make sure you go downhill when you like when I'm going downhill here I got gravity help and push that down if I was coming up this incline I'd have to push it up the hill so make sure you always hoe going down the slope it's a lot less laborsome that just some tips and like I said I only reason I'm doing this is for the guy that doesn't have the equipment and and, and wants to do some rat weed eradication uh, just by showing him some simple hand tools uh, with the willpower you can get it done